Christian, you probably have asked yourself the question, I hope you have anyway, as someone who loves Jesus, what would I need to do to have the greatest impact? What would I need to do to be a person who is used of God? What would I need to do to be a person who seizes their divine moment? And by the way, the Bible's full of God's story, record of uh, people who seize their divine moment. Also, because this is just true of humans, it's also full of God's stories of people who did not seize their divine moment. For example, uh, we studied David in Sunday school today, and uh, David wanted to see the glory of God, and so when the time came that Goliath stood in front of him, he didn't run. He seized his divine moment. He probably didn't know that morning when he woke up to go and take some lunch to his brothers. He probably didn't know, hey, this may be one of the greatest days that I ever lived, but the truth is, in hindsight, David, all of his life, would be remembered for fighting Goliath. Uh, let, let me give you a negative one. Uh, Moses was called to uh, take the children of Israel out of Egypt. Uh, depends on who you ask, two to the three million people. They came to the Jordan River and... Uh, they were that close to the promised land. Twelve spies were sent out. Ten came back and said, no, nah, we're not going to seize our divine moment. The giants are too big. It's going to be hard. There's difficulty. And two of them said, everything they said is true, but I want to remind you, Joshua and Caleb said, the promises of God are greater than the difficulties we're going to face. The crowd believed the negative report. And only Joshua and Caleb, think of this, two to three million people, only Joshua and Caleb, the only two adults that got to go in the promised land. Well, what would we need to do to uh, seize our divine moment as a church or as an individual? And uh, there's two things you have to know. One is, if I'm going to be all that God wants me to be, I have to know how God works in a person's life. And I'm going to tell you something. If I had become a Christian last week and knew what I know about God. I would rather know the message I'm going to preach to you than any other message of the Bible because any other message for the Christian can build on this. If I want to be used of God, number one, I have to know how does God work in the life of a person of God. Second, I would have to know how to wait for God's best. And you find this illustrated all through Scripture. How does God work in the life of people? Because what I find is there are similarities between how God worked. Let me give you some examples. How God worked in the life of Abraham, there's a pattern. Uh, Abraham was an older man, so if you're a senior adult like Abraham was, God can work in your life. In a similar fashion, God worked in the life of Esther. Esther was a younger woman, probably in her early, late 20s or early 30s. God works him in the life of David, who was a teenager. If you're a teenager, can I be used of God? Absolutely. Uh, let me give you another example. Uh, every year around Christmas time, we normally preach on the Christmas story. Uh, Mary was probably 13 years old or so. People married young back in those days. And what you'll see is, if you looked at every verse on, on each of those four people I just mentioned, you will find a pattern. God does specific things and the lives of people. But not only that, if you love reading Christian biographies, you'll find that the way God spoke and molded Abraham is very similar to the way he molded uh, Billy Graham. You'll find it all through church history and all through Scripture. And so I want to look at that today. H how does God mold me? How does God shape me? How does God work in the life of a believer? And second, uh, how do I learn how to wait on God's best? I want to use Galatians chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 7 through 10. Very famous verses, but I'm going to confess to you, uh, it took me a few years of even teaching these verses to really grasp what God is saying. Listen to this. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in well-doing, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, 
let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Uh, don't, don't raise your hand, but a lot of you may have had an impression about this verse that, that I had. I'm telling you, uh, for four or five years, I even taught on it some. And my impression of this verse was uh, it was a negative teaching. Negative doesn't mean wrong. It just meant it taught a negative truth. Uh, if you're doing something bad, you, you, you're going to reap what you sow. Is that kind of how you have viewed that? In other words, uh, as I was 19, 20, 21 years old, somebody's over here living in great sin, you would hear some of the older saints in our church say something like this. Oh, you can't mock God. A man reaps what he sows, which, by the way, is true. Uh, Paul, Paul has this much of that in this verse. He says, hey, let me give you a biblical principle that you cannot uh, overcome. In other words, whether you want to or not, this is the principle. It's like the law of gravity. Here's the law. You reap what you sow. Uh, if you sow to your flesh, guess what? You're going to reap destruction. If you sow to the flesh, you reap destruction. If you sow to the Spirit, you reap life everlasting. But three or four years as a Christian, it dawned on me that wasn't actually his emphasis. In other words, that verse really wasn't a verse where someone's falling into sin like, oh, you're going to reap what you sow. God's going to get you. Really, that's not what he was saying. Let me tell you what Paul is doing. Paul is a spiritual cheerleader in Galatians 6. He's preaching not just to a church, he's preaching to some churches. They're discouraged. They're not seeing the fruit they used to see. Now, there's some persecution. So Paul does this. He says, come on, guys. Don't give up. You, you can't mock God. Now, that's a little different than how I was interpreting it. I was interpreting Paul mainly saying, uh, God's going to get you. Lightning bolt's going to fall. Is that, that kind of a view? That's not what he's saying. Or there's judgment. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, don't you dare give up. Well, why shouldn't we give up? You kidding me? You can't mock God. You, you reap what you sow. Keep on praying. And the Galatian, why well, should I keep on praying? I've been praying three years and God ain't. Because if you keep on sowing prayer when you least expect it, yeah, you're going to get a lightning bolt. You're going to get a lightning bolt of a blessing of God. Keep on witnessing. And I used to witness, but I just not see anybody say, hey, Paul says, you can't mock God. It is a law. Just like the person who lives in sin, they cannot escape the judgment of God apart from forgiveness. Guess what? You can't mock God. Keep on witnessing. When you least expect it, somebody's going to get saved. Uh, keep on worshiping. Keep on believing. Uh, we say this, I hear it all the time. How's a good message on, on witnessing? I, I used to witness a lot. There, there's a lot of used to quit Christians in declining churches, by the way. That's why we're declining. You know, we, we used to do this. We used to be involved in women's Bible study. We used to go out and witness. We used to be a church that lived on mission. And Paul says, come on. You can't mock God. Now, we know this. Why? Because of his connecting word. He's talking to deacons. He's talking to pastors. He's talking to Christians who's got discouraged. Don't give up if you keep on sowing. Listen, I preach all the time, and it's amazing. Sometimes I'll pop in somewhere, and, I, and you just wouldn't expect it. And you go home and you say, hey, 20 grown men got saved. Why? Because you cannot mock God. You keep on sowing, and you keep on believing, and you keep on praying, and, and, and you keep on studying. Sooner or later, God shows up and does something. That's why he says, because of this, don't grow weary in well-doing. In due season, you're going to reap. You, you, you have no right as a Christian to be discouraged. That's what he's saying. If you're discouraged, you don't understand the principle. Listen, you can't say God's not going to bless you. You can't mock God. He's a God who blesses. Keep on giving. Keep on praying. Keep on with. Then he says this, verse 10. Therefore, if you know anything about the English language, therefore is a connecting word. In other words, He's saying, now, let me sum up everything I'm telling you. Do good to all people. Why should I do good? Because you can't mock God. If you do enough good, good comes back to you. Now, Paul's also saying this. The great hindrance, the great hindrance to sowing is weariness. That's what he's saying in verse 9. A weariness that results and giving up a weariness that results in throwing in the towel a weariness that results in discouragement I'm going to say again as I said in my introduction 
to not grow weary, I have to understand two things. Number one, how God works. And I'm going to tell you, it's amazing. God doesn't work the way you and I work. He doesn't. And the day I discovered that, a weight lifted off me. Frustration, frustration lifted off. Second, I not only have to discover how God works in your life, I have to discover how to wait for God's best. So let me tell you what God does. First of all, God gives us, I'm going to call it a dream. He, he gives us his vision. He gives us his goal. By the way, there's nothing more powerful than a dream. Martin Luther stood up and said, uh, Martin Luther King, I have a dream. It changed America. Uh, George Washington and other folks said, we've got a dream. And I'm going to tell you, if you ever read American history, for George Washington to have a dream against the British Empire, there's no way that's going to work, but, but, but it did. We're here today. There, there, there is power in a dream. That's why someone famous once said, uh, the pen is mightier than the sword. You have a gun on you this morning, I promise you. You might inflict some damage uh, uh, temporarily, but I'm going to tell you, there's more power in the word I hold in my hand than all the weapons in the world. There is power in a dream. Uh, if I said, what did Noah do? Well, you can tell me his dream. He built an ark. Uh, what did Abraham do? We preached him last week. Well, he's father of many nations. Did he think that up? No, God gave him a dream. God gives us a dream. Now I can preach a series on it. Uh, let me just say a few things. Uh, the dream is always bigger than you. By the way, that, that's one reason we run away from it. See, my early days trying to serve God, he'd give a big dream, and in my wisdom, I'd say, well, I wouldn't mind doing it, but I don't have the money, I don't have the resources. The more I studied Scripture, the more I realized nobody had the resources. I, I, Noah had never seen a, a ship built. By the way, isn't this neat? God says, I'm going to flood the earth through rain. Noah could say, what's rain? Because if you've read that scripture, it had never rained before. There, there's always impossibilities, which does what? Which keeps me from taking a step. Either I don't want to do it, or I say this. Well, I love the Lord, and just as soon as he gives everything I need, and I don't say it this way, but here's what I mean. He gives me everything I need that does not require faith, I think I'll obey. Well, if it doesn't require faith, I can obey that. But it takes faith. Without faith, in fact, it's impossible. Somebody says, it's hard to please God without faith. No, it's not hard. It's tough. No, it's not tough. It is impossible to please God without faith. Let me tell you something I find interesting. I'm just going to apply it to you. Do you know the greatest growth in your church? And I knew this would be, but I had Carol look it up. I wanted to make sure. The greatest growth in your church do you think it was when you had the, the foggiest vision or the clearest vision? What, what would be your guess? You, do you, do you, think, you think when you filled up two services here, do you think it was when you just kind of floated through life or you had a laser focus to what God wanted you to do? Let me tell you how clear your vision was. I can quote it to you. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If you came to me right now, I know in the newsletter there's a vision statement. It's biblical. It's just not good. It's hard to remember. And I'm going to tell you how hard it is. If you, right now, so I'll give you $100, Steve. I can't quote it. I know there's a lot of ease, and then there's a, something, there's a, there's a vision statement at the bottom. But can I tell you, in 2005, you averaged for the year 511 people. But by the way, you, you're not at a funeral home. That, you, you can swallow that, that. That's pretty good. That, I, I wasn't here, but, but, but I'll give somebody some do. Somebody worked hard. 511 for the year means sometimes you had 480, sometimes you had 650, but when you averaged it out, y'all were hitting some home runs. 2017, the last year we have a record up, because this is 2018, you averaged 220. That's a pretty good drop, but it's really worse than that. 220 right now would be a good Sunday for y'all. Can, can I tell you what your dream was? The pastor at that time, Pastor Butch, I looked it up. Actually, I didn't, Carol did. By the way, I think Carol was celebrating 22 years as secretary here. Is that true? So, so she, she's, she's working somewhere else right now. But you might want to email her or thank her. That's, that's awesome. By the way, she, she's good. You got a good one in that lady. She's good. And, and, and so when you had 511 average attendance, now get this. I, I promise I'm telling the truth. Give me $100 after service. I cannot, I, I can't quote it. I don't know. I don't know what your video. I, I read it a few times. I see it every Sunday. got pretty good memory. I, I don't know what it is. But I can't tell you what it was in those days. It was four words. Worship, connect, serve, 
and reach. Worship is self-explanatory. Connect is not quite as explanatory. Connect meant we need to be in small groups. You know why? Because their vision was so big, they knew they were going to grow, and you can't just be in the big group. You better get in Sunday school, women's ministry. You better get in men's ministry. You better get in some small groups. Uh, serve, pretty self-explanatory. Reach is not quite as explanatory because you could say, we won't reach everybody. No, that's not what they said. They said specifically, we want to reach the unchurched, and we want to reach lost people. You think you had more baptisms when it was clear, or you think you had more baptisms when it was foggy? By the way, this is good news. You know what it means? See, I go in some churches where I say, I hate to tell you this, you used to run 600, but there's a military base. The town is half, it used to be 10,000 people, now it's 5,000. I don't know, I'm not sure if you can ever quite grasp that anymore because you want there's more people here in 2018 than there was in 2005. I've looked at your census. But yet you ran more in 2005. This is good news. It's not for a lack of people. You regain the vision. Because when God gives a dream, you build everything around. So I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but if, if, if ever so often you got a pastor saying, well, we're going to worship, uh, we're going we to connect, uh, we're going to serve, we're going to reach. You tell me that enough, pretty soon if I'm at the coffee shop or wherever I am, and somebody says, what's your church all about? I know what it's about because that's all that dude talks about over and over and over and over and over. And you know why that's what he talks about? Because he put a little old trailer up, and the world said, because I preach to these pastors, well, bless the heart, I ain't got nothing but a trailer. No, you're wrong, pastor. That trailer means nothing. They got a dream from the dream giver. They got a dream from God. And with a dream, nothing is impossible. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'd be so excited about that. If I stood up and sit here and said, listen, here's what you got to have. Have to have some millionaires. Well, shoot, if I have to have some millionaires to do what I'm doing, to preach across Southeast, I'm in trouble. I have to have a millionaire. Now, God may raise some up. But by the way, millionaires die. I, I tell you that. But your trust is in God. Well, you got to have the highest IQ in Georgia. Well, I'm, if that's what is required, then I don't have the highest IQ in Georgia. Uh, well, you gotta, you gotta be this, you gotta be that. No, there's one thing required. And this is what J God tells Mary, by the way. Because in case you don't remember that Christmas story, it was pretty audacious. Mary, you're gonna have a son. She says, just one problem. I'm a virgin. And you know, remember the answer from the angel? With God, all things are possible. The literal Greek meaning is, with a word from God, anything can be done. Isn't that amazing? And so, uh, he gives us a dream. Second thing is this. It's all through Scripture. By the way, do you think, do you think Gideon had a dream? If you don't, if you're in any kind of leadership, resign the day. If you, Gideon had a dream. Did, did Esther have a dream? Did, did, did Moses just get up one day and say, I'm tired of these sheep. I'm going to go talk to Pharaoh, see what's up with that dude. Oh, no. And if you believe that, take a little sabbatical and read some scripture, and your, your Christian life will be a whole lot smoother. They call it the burning bush experience. There's a dream. Then second, there has to be a decision. You know what the decision is? Well, I can tell you a long time ago on a trailer, I'm sure a lot of people, when they went out and said, come on, join us, where you were, a little old trailer, I bet a lot of folks said, mm, nah. But I bet enough people said, where is that? They both made a decision. Those folks who came out with Moses, about two million of them said, we ain't going. Well, then you're not going. But can I tell you, God is so great, you might not go, but your children won't grow. I don't know if you've ever read that story closely. We talk about roaming 40 years in the wilderness. It took nine months to go from the Red Sea to the Jordan River. Nine months. But it took 39 years and three months. They walked, they walked out in the wilderness until every adult besides Joshua and Caleb died. And when the kids got grown, God says, Now! Now! I need my dream fulfilled because the dream is never really my dream. It's just, it's just my part in the heart of God. So there's a decision. Now, can I be honest with you? I don't know. Will you make that kind of decision? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if you'll make the decision that folks in that trailer made. I don't know because I'm going to assume something. I'm going to assume some of them wrote some checks. They probably couldn't afford the right. But they, would that be true? They, they believed in the dream so much. I'm going to assume some folks said, 
well, I'm going to come out on Monday, Tuesday night and go, I, I'm going to go invite some folks to church. And the truth is, they probably were tired from working all day just like we are, but they said, I've got a dream. I'm going to give some to God. Uh, there were probably folks who showed up at VBS, whatever, the, whatever ministry was going on. Why? Because they said uh, the dream is so huge. And so there's always a decision that we've got to make. And I'm just being honest with you. That's why when Jesus preached, he, he would say, if you want to come after me. Well, what do you mean? Jesus, if, if in the dictionary means maybe you will, maybe you won't. Jesus is saying, well, people have a choice. I don't know what you're going to do, but you can't escape the decision. So well, I'm going to wait a while. Well, that, that's the decision. The, the answer is no, I'm not going to do it right now. But you will either say yes to the dream of God or you'll say no to the dream of God. Let me tell you something God said. And this just shows you how humbling it is to be a human. In Deuteronomy, God says, uh, let me tell you something I've done for you folks. I've set before you blessings and curses. I would hope that I understand that. But you know what God says? I've set before you blessings and cursings. I've set before you life and death. Uh, choose life. Really? God, do you really have to tell me this? Yeah, because I'm dense. You ever notice on the dream and decision, God invites us all through Scripture. There, there, there's no God story without invitation. I mentioned Esther. Mordecai says, uh, here's what you ought to do. I don't know if I can do that. And Mordecai says, I got news for you, young lady. Whether you decide yes or no, God's going to save the Jews. But if you're not careful, you're going to face the judgment of God. And that's when she said, okay, let, let's pray fast. And so all through Scripture, God invites folks, and this is, this is what I think every time I read through Scripture, through, through, through all, the, all the Bible. Just in case I miss it, it comes at the end of Revelation, Revelation chapter 22. It's not the last verse, but four or five verses before the Bible ends. Remember, if I've read through Genesis and Exodus, all through the Bible, he invites Isaiah, he invites Jeremiah, he invites Mary to be the mother of Jesus, he invites John the Baptist, he invites Peter, he invites the fishermen, come follow me, all these people. In case I miss it, as I'm concluding the Bible, here's what Jesus says. By the way, if you're reading from a red letter Bible, you get in Revelation, that last chapter, you'll see some red letters right before you end the Bible. You know what Jesus says? And the Spirit and the bride says, Come! And every time I read that, I'm thinking, Lord, thank you because sheep are stupid and I'm a sheep I've just read the whole Bible and just in case I miss all these invitations to life you tap me on my spiritual shoulder and says just in case you too hard headed both the spirit and the bride is saying come on experience all that God wants you to experience third thing is this and this is something from scripture that I think is difficult there's a delay there's a delay. I don't know who all studied what today, but, but since the class I popped in, did studied David. Anybody else studied David today? Well, we can check that Sunday school class. They may be studying some stuff they're not supposed to be studying. <laughs> and this is the pattern, by the way. Last week I preached on Abraham. Remember Abraham was 75 years old? It seemed impossible. Going to have a son with Sarah? No way. Every time I read that, I think, oh, oh, oh you, don't, you don't know the half of it. No, you're not. Abraham, you, you're not going to have the baby when you're 78. You're going to be 25 years. David was anointed king. You know how, how long it was before he became king? 12 to 14 years. Jesus is going to preach. He lives 33 and a half years. You know when he starts preaching? Not me, because I'm not God. I, I, I just said, son, you, you, you done confound the wise men when you're 12. By the time you're 15, we're going to get you on the preaching circuit around Loganville. We're we going to confound everybody. You know why? Because I don't think like God, and you don't either. And if you don't know this, you'll give up. I'm going to give an illustration. Some of you won't get it because you're not serving God. You never tried. If you're serving God, you'll get it. Uh, let, let's just say where I'm standing physically is where I am spiritually. And I'll just pick a ministry. Let's just let's pick student ministry. Let's say I'm teaching Sunday school class, youth, I'm, I'm teaching Bible study, I'm, I'm volunteer, I'm doing anything they want me to do. And I just feel like God wants me to be a student pastor. It could be a missionary, it could be anything. Now, you know what my understanding is? This is just to me, this seems about how God should work. If for me to be in the will of God meant that I have to walk to the first chair in the little orchestra area 
I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. And I think y'all do the same thing. I'm just going to walk right, right across. Is that how you would do it? I would just, if I'm going over there, would you just walk right over there? If you want that chair, would you walk over there first? Then over there? Then maybe out the exit door? But you know what God does? You're over here and say, I'm, I'm going to be a student pastor. And before you know it, you're out the exit door. Now, some of you got the blank look. I apologize. You don't know what I'm talking about because you're not serving God. I'm just telling you, this is a little bit of meat today. So, But some of you are like, mm-hmm. I, I preached probably 50 revivals. That's a lot of revivals for a young guy. Probably preached 50 revivals in college before I, it finally dawned on me that God is not in a hurry. And here's what happens. If you've ever done this, you start serving God. And again, in my mind, is this, let me give you an example, another example. If you told me, go out to your car as quick as you can. From where I am, probably that exit right there will get me the quickest in my car. Do, do, you, think, do you think that way, straight lines? If you don't, you don't have common sense. Do, 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 do you think that way? Because most of us do. That's why God says, it's my favorite two verses of the Bible, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in God with all your heart. Do not lean on common sense. That's what the Hebrew phrase means. If you don't have common sense, you don't have much to worry about. But those of us with common sense, <laughs> is it not frustrating? Have you ever had this experience? Because I did. I'm over here, and I'm going to be student pastor. And all of a sudden, six, eight months later, I'm over here. You know what I'm saying? Well, I don't understand this. Lord, I was closer to you before I got on my knees and said, Yes, I'll obey you. This won't make any sense. And all through my 30 years of ministry, I've had guys say, I thought I was called to the mission field. And my ears perk up. Because some people think and they're not. What happened? Oh, I applied. They didn't accept me. What else? Oh, that was it. Really? Well, I told God to go to the seminary. What happened? Well, you know, I just, the money never came. Really? No, what God does is you're making a mistake. And I made it. You, you think God thinks like you. You know what God is doing? He did this with Abraham. He did it with David. You know why David was such a great king? Because for 12 years, God kept on molding and shaping him. And so I didn't know at the time. Now I do. So I'm over here, and I'm saying, what's up with this? And by the way, you'll get frustrated. You'll get bitter sometimes. There, there's folks mad at God. You know why? Because they'd like to be doing what I'm doing this morning. But, but when they said yes, instead of a straight line, God put them over here by the exit door, and finally they said, Heck with this. Here's what God's doing. You're not ready for that big ministry. He's got you over there in obscurity. He's got you over there molding. He's got you over there shaping. Let me give you an illustration. Uh, I'm, I'm from Texas, and uh, when I grew up, in the area I grew up in, you, you, you didn't go anywhere. I mean, every morning on school bus, you just, you just hey, there's a 500 cows over there, 600, just cows everywhere. Let me show you why I'm saying this. I have a Bible that I not, all my Bibles are not this way. This Bible has as, as good leather as you can buy. I had it put on there. So I'm going to be honest with you. You ever see a cow that look like that? I mean, I've never seen a cow have high like that. They don't, they don't, you know what happened? That cow died. I mean, they, they took the hide off. They, and when they take the hide off, just, you know. They don't live. I mean, they have to, you know, there's no cow going around with no hide on <laughs> But when they took it off, you've ever seen them do it, you know what it looks like? It's ugly. It's, it's bloody, and it just doesn't look good. Now, I couldn't do it. You couldn't, and if you can do this, if you can do it like this, and by the way, th th there are people we call masters at doing this. Uh, some of you ladies know this. Uh, you can go buy a purse for almost nothing, but you can also buy a purse for $1,000. You, you, you know the difference? The craftsmanship, the leather, you know, what, you know what happens? A master tanner gets that cowhide, and they use the word manipulate. We think that's a negative word. Usually it is how we use it. He takes that old hide, he manipulates it. And you know what happens? You go to the shoe store, and you're like, that pair of shoes is $800. Uh, that cowboy boots are this. They want $200 for that Bible. Well, the word's the word, but the difference is the paper's better, but the difference is, is the leather. You know what God does? He kills you spiritually. Unless a grain of wheat does what? And so I didn't know this, but when I'm over there, and I don't go there again, but when I'm all the way over there, you know what he's doing? I'm 
And so that little town of 200 people I grew up in, I pastored a church that had 7,000 members. Doesn't that blow your mind? The big town to me was 10 miles down the road. It had 2,000 people. My church had three and a half times the people. You know why? Because I finally learned. And now what my wife and I have learned, and I didn't always know this, when trouble used to hit me when I was 22, 23, 24, you know what I'd do? I'd go home from those meetings. That was back before everybody had a computer. Pull the typewriter out. Type up that resume. I don't have to take this. There's other churches besides Summit in Georgia. Get me out of here. And God will let you go out of there. You know what you find? Let me put it in your language since you're not, you're not in my type of work. Well, I like Kmart, but we got a new manager. I don't have to take this. I got me a job at Walmart. And for six months, the manager was pretty good, but then he gets transferred, and that same old and that's not the same one, but the same type of manager comes in. I call them sandpaper people. They're just abrasive. About two days of that, three days, you come home from work, and you walk through the door like this. Honey, what's wrong? I don't know what I'm going to talk about today. And you know what somebody's been doing? And this is not the funny part of it. You've been running all your life from God, and you're not really a trophy anymore. You don't have a spiritual backbone. You don't have wisdom because every time a storm comes your way, oh, I can fix this. And you run, and you run, and you run. And I've learned this. It's not my way of doing it. I've learned that when God does things, for example, Jesus said, the greatest preacher ever lived. Who, who do you think that would be? A man that preached six months and had his head cut off. Because God measures impact in a different way than we do. And we just protect us. I mean, we, I, I know people who have been going to church 50 years. They get offended. Brother, you didn't, Jeff, you, you didn't sing the right hymn today. They go, well, I just I'm sure I'm sure I'm sing my favorite hymn. It's been two weeks since I sang my favorite hymn. And God looked at you and says, you ain't going to have to worry about your favorite hymn. I'm about to put you by the exit door, and I'm about to rain down some, some storms on you. But guess what? If you look at it appropriately, you're going you to stand firm, and you're going to be somebody one day who I'm going to use to really be a blessing. And, and then there's going to be difficulties. Just let me ask you this since you read Scripture. Did Abraham have any difficulties did David face any difficulty in being king? Like how God does it. You're, I feel this way sometimes. You do too. I'm minding my own business. I'm like a David. I'm okay. I don't mind. I don't mind being around the sheep. I'm by myself. I'm old enough. Sometimes sheep are better than being around people. I don't mind being out here, Lord. It's okay. I'm good. It's so fine. No, no, no. I'm going to make you king. Now, see, when you're younger, I'm going to be king. Now you're like, Lord, are you sure? Because the greater platform he gives you, the greater spiritual warfare comes against you. You know that, right? See, it's easier to not be a deacon, criticize the deacon, than actually be a deacon being criticized. Everybody know what I'm talking about? It's easier not to serve on the personnel team and get some criticism than be on the personnel team and be part of the guy getting the criticism. Hey, it's easier to sit where you're sitting than be the guy who's up here because... You know, there's always some. Why don't you preach on Revelation? That's my favorite. Why don't you preach on Genesis? That's my favorite. Why don't you preach on this? That's my favorite. Because I, I don't want to. And so here's God, and He calls David. And don't you, you ever done this? I've done it. Lord, I actually had some friends in East Texas before you started calling me to preach. Lord, I actually got invited, not to bad parties, I actually got invited to some pretty wholesome parties. So you told me to witness all the time. They don't want me to come anymore. And, and David's going to be king. And guess what? God didn't tell him this. He didn't tell him about the difficulties. Oh, by the way, the guy you're going to replace, he's going to try to kill you a few times. Oh. Uh, by the way, to really become the king won't be too long. You'll have to fight a man about 10 foot tall. By the way, he's going to have a lot of armor. You won't have anything but me, but I'll be with you. You just won't see me. All right. And there's going to be difficult, and it's always two areas in Scripture. There's critics, and, and, and I know we say, oh, don't bother me. It normally bothers, critics bother most of it. I don't like critics. I, I've learned how to give the God, but what I'm saying is I don't give them the warning saying, boy, I hope, I, boy, I hope some critics get me today. <laughs> I mean, I've never done that. I, I, don't, I don't dwell on it anymore, but I'm just saying critics bother most folks. If you don't think so, go up to somebody today and say, you know, I was watching you when you were in the choir. Uh, worst singing I've ever heard in my life. 
Now, most of us don't say, man, thank you. I, was, I, I prayed this morning. Somebody say that to me. That's a blessing. Critics and circumstances. And if you look at Scripture, it always worked against people. Critics came against folks in bad circumstances. Because, again, if you don't know that, you know what I say? I said this when I was younger. Well, it can't be of God why, because I said I'd do it. And it looks like every door is closing. No, don't, don't be too quick on that, those doors closing. Don't be too quick on opposition. Because the problem is, opposition is all through Scripture. And in case we miss it, one of the greatest disciple maker in the history of the world, in fact, the greatest besides Jesus, Apostle Paul said, yeah, all those who live godly will, what? Will suffer some persecution. Uh, then there's going to be some dead ends. And if you don't know dead ends, you'll quit. I I'm convinced of this. I think a lot of times folks are serious about God and, and they stand on the brink of a miracle, but they give up. Uh, they, they, they stand on the brink of going to the promised land. They stand on the brink of uh, being what God wants to be. They stand on the brink of whatever it is. They just don't go forward. There's always going to be dead ends. Let me give you an example. When Moses heard God, here's what happens. This is part of, of uh, difficulties, but it ends in dead ends. Moses, if you've ever read Scripture, Moses is in the will of God when he's taking the people out of Egypt. I mean, we don't, no doubt about it. But don't you hate this? And if you don't read Scripture, it frustrates you. So I'm obeying God. Because think about it. This is true of my life. Because before I was obeying God in my little town, I went to any party. I did anything I wanted to do. And so everybody seemed kind of, I'm, I'm sure they didn't really like me. I don't know. But they always seemed to kind of like me because that's how they were living. And Moses seems pretty content. He's 80 years old. If you read the Exodus 3 account, he tells God, I don't really want to do this. I can't talk. I can't do it. And then he, then he ends up saying, I, you know, Egyptians have a lot of gods. I don't even know what your name is. That's where we get the, I am who I am. In other words, he answers every objection. Then you hear God, and there comes a time where you've got two to three million people and the Egyptian army, which is the most advanced army of Moses' day, they're behind you. They're coming after you in church. You can see the dust. And you're at the Red Sea. And you're hearing babies scream and mothers saying, What have you got us into now? Have you ever been there? Because there's a temptation to tell God, If you'll just get me out of this, I'll close my Bible. I won't ever witness again. I won't ever open my mouth again. But what happens is we come to dead ends, and those of God, why? Because you've ever read that passage, one of my favorite verses in there. In Exodus 14, you know what God says? Moses, you stand still. I'm, I'm going to fight for you. The, the message Bible, if you have one, I have it memorized, but it says something like this on that verse. Moses, tell the people to shut their mouth. And when they do, I'm going to work. And so one of my prayers, not daily, time I often pray, Lord, help me keep my mouth shut when it's words that are not of you. I'd rather see God work. And then there's this. There's deliverance. And by the way, we love deliverance, don't we? I got good news. Somebody gave some money today. Praise God. What you don't know is your wife, she took your debit card and cleaned you out. But praise God for the church. In other words, I want God to work, but I'd rather... Let Clay do all the giving. I'll get up here and rejoice about it. You ever have that thought? Everybody wants a testimony. They don't realize it comes to the word test. I want a message, but the first phrase is mess. A message has come from a mess. When you get delivered, by the way, one of the greatest songs written was written after they went through the Red Sea. You know why? Because they got delivered. They said, the horse and the rider, he's thrown into the sea. Song of Moses. But here's the problem. You can't sing that song and mean it. Unless you've been serving God and you're standing here saying, Lord, I don't get it. Woo, I got the Red Sea in front of me. I can't get through on my own. I got the enemy behind me and I'm not strong enough. I cannot do it. I guess all I can do is hit my knees and trust in you. That's how God works. And if you don't understand that, you'll never be much for God. 
If you don't understand that, by the way, you'll begin to serve God, and good folks will come to you and say, hey, we might need to stop. There's a couple of church members don't like what we're doing, and this person may leave the church. Because we don't understand conflict, we don't understand controversy, we don't understand how God tests us, we don't understand difficulties, we don't understand all these things that kind of serve as a pattern. Now let me end by saying this. When you read Scripture, there's two tremendous promises that God gives us. Number one, he gives us his principles to guide us. Somebody said this day in Sunday school. They said they listened to Charles Stanley. And this morning, Dr. Stanley said, I live in Joshua 1, 1 through 9. Oh, I say, I, 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 I've worn out some Bibles. I've got tape on some of my Bibles. Because God tells Joshua, hey, Moses is dead. Now, you get up. You take his place. You carry these folks into the promised land. He'd served with Moses for 40 years. He understood, oh, what, you mean me? I'm going to be criticized. I'm going to be, it's me. It's my responsibility. And then he says, don't fear. Three times, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. So we have the principles of God that God, someone says, I just don't know what to do. Yeah, you do. You just don't, you just don't know. You just don't want to do what you're supposed to do. I don't know what to do. If I did, I'd do it. Do you tithe? Well, no. Congratulations. That's for everybody. Uh, he messed it up. I was going to say there's never any amens on that. <laughs> one. Uh, Pastor, if I just knew what to do, the will of God, I'd do it. Congratulations. The Great Commission is the will of God for every Christian. Go back to 10th grade after the summer and witness to everybody. But, you know, they never, they never shout. Oh, okay. We've got the principles of God to guide us. And get this, great promise. We have the presence of God to guard us. Let me ask you something, Digger. And, and, and she don't mind disagreeing. She doesn't mind this. If we had a word from God, would you be afraid to move to Mars to any place in the world? I wouldn't. You know, when I was 20, I'd be like, uh, I wouldn't. Because the safest place to be is in the will of God. And if you don't know that, you know what you'll do? You'll leave services. All you see is empty seats. You'll leave, all you see is low finances. But if you see God, you still see that because you have to know what to pray about. But the greatness of God far outweighs that. Maybe why somebody, I didn't do it, don't know who did it, but somebody had the wisdom for whoever's on this stage. Because you know, when you're on the stage, you see some, you see some sad, sorry-looking faces sometimes. You know, not at Summit, but you know, in other churches, you, you, you see that. <laughs> and somebody must have said, you know, for those who sing and those who are musicians and those who teach all they got to do is look up every once in a while and they'll see it's big he is lord isn't that great then when you get over here if you look at somebody who's just like oh man like, oh, i don't care about this you look and say he is risen so whoever did that uh, that's an awesome thing and if he is lord and if the tomb is empty and the throne's occupied it looks like some is probably in pretty good hands as we think about resetting the church and being all that God wants us to be. I want every head bowed, every eyes closed. I don't know where you are today in your spiritual journey. I know we are all can be in different places. Some of us are in the same place, but a lot of us are in different places. Some of you set through a message like this, and all it is is encouragement because you are so pumped up to serve God. As we talk about these six things, you just, in your mind, absolutely, absolutely because you, you not only have read it in Scripture, you've lived it. It's a cycle. You just live it. And I would just encourage you, keep, keep doing what you're doing. Keep, summit needs you. The kingdom needs you. The Lord wants to use you. Keep on doing what you're doing. Fight through weariness. Fight through any discouragement. Keep on, keep on sowing. You can't mock God. He's going he's to allow you to reap what you're sowing. You're sowing good things. Keep on sowing them. Or maybe you're hearing you say, see, th this message really convicts me because the truth is I used to sow good seeds. I used to sow a lot of great things. I, I guess I've got weary in the battle. I understand. I've been there before. I, I guess I've grown discouraged. I've been discouraged before. I don't think it's where I should be, but I've been there before. You know, the great thing about God, maybe today's a day to start fresh. Start doing good again, as Paul says. Therefore, do good to everybody, especially those of the faith. Why? Because you can't mock God. He's going to bless you. 
maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I've become a Christian sometime back, whether it's a year, two years, five years, 20 years. But I've been frustrated. I, I didn't realize God worked that way. I just viewed every, every bad circumstance as God closing doors. I viewed every criticism as God trying to tell me not to do something. And that's not always true. And maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I've, I've never made that commitment as a Christian. You talk about a message for a Christian. I, I don't know Jesus that way. You know you could know him today. You could ask him into your life to be your Lord and Savior. I'd love to talk to you about it. We're going to have an invitation. You, you can talk to the Lord where you are. The altar's open. I'd love to talk to you if you need that. But church, don't grow weary in doing good. Don't grow weary when you've seen better numbers. Don't, don't grow weary when the circumstances are not always what you want them to be. You're going, you're going to reap all the good things you're sowing if you'll just wait on his timing. Father, we come before you. And I'm thankful. But Lord, I know as I, as I serve here, I know there's folks here, some, some who I don't even know who they are. But Lord, they've been here for a long time. They're, they're part of why there's a summit church. Thank you for those folks that went before some who've come recently. I thank you for those, uh, Lord, who are here, maybe not been here as long. But Lord, they love you and they're serving. Father, I, I thank you for those that we don't see yet because they haven't joined. They're not here yet, but they're going to come and the days ahead, the next year, two, five, ten years, Lord, you're going to bring people. Lord, help us be the people you want us to be. Help them to find a church called Summit that has a great vision from a great God. And we're excited about it. Father, we give this invitation time. You do what you want, how you want to do it. And Lord, may you receive glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I ask if you would to stand.